This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. I want to emphasize that it's been some time that I haven't enjoyed reading a history book. And that's because I don't have much time. But when I stumble upon certain books that come highly recommended, I do dive in. Uh, the gentleman who's a bit late, standing in the middle, that's Tom Young right there. <laughs> Tom Young's a good friend. Hi, Tom. <laughs> if you don't know him, one of the best painters in this country. He highly recommended that I meet you, Catherine. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Tom. And when Tom suggested I check out the book, I held myself to Antoine Library. If anyone hasn't seen this book, it's actually in the middle, on the barrel, right in the middle. It's a storytelling at its finest. I've only read a few books that I think meet, meet the caliber of what you've done. One of them is from an old professor of mine at AUB, uh, Salim Deringa, if you know this name. Mm -hmm. It was called The Ottoman Twilight of the Arab Lands. And the moment I saw Twilight Cities, without knowing what was inside, I was drawn to it. That book was about the last decades of Ottoman rule and the collapse of an otherwise sturdy empire from the outside. And then suddenly, history moves on. We're in European mandatory rule very quickly. I think this kind of book is that kind of flavor stretched out over a long period of time, over an expansive region. We're going to cover only two cities mentioned in this book, Tyre, Sur, and Carthage. But I should note that the book carries on to Syracuse, uh, Ravenna, I hope I said this right, mm -hmm. Ravenna, and Antioch. So... I highly recommend getting this book. If you like physical copies, it's available for purchase. So that's my long introduction. Mm -hmm. By way of thanking you for doing this with me, uh, I think you arrived last night to Beirut. Yes. Uh, yesterday, early hours. I'm, I'm tired. You're yeah. tired. You're jet lagged. <laughs> You've been on a regional tour celebrating this work. Mm -hmm. So I promise to be very easy Thank on you. you. <laughs> So I'd like to actually ask you why you chose these cities, and more importantly, why you begin with Tyre, with Sur. So when I set out to write this book, I wasn't entirely sure from the outset which cities I was going to include, but I always knew that it would start with Tyre, with Sur, because while well, Tyre is one of the most ancient cities, is the most ancient city I do discuss in this book, one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities, but also crucially, while it hasn't been a capital or as great a metropolis for as long as some of the other cities I come to, in terms of its cultural influence and its influence on Mediterranean history and the development of Mediterranean cultural exchange, that influence is profound. So that's why Tyre, I knew Tyre would be the starting point. The other two cities that I knew would be in the book from the outset were Syracuse mm. on the southeast coast of Sicily and Antioch, Antakya, the sort of southernmost city of Turkey, very close to the border with Syria. Right. Um, and these cities were the starting points for me because, for me, they represent starting points and crossing places in Mediterranean history. And one of the main questions I wanted, well, one of the main questions I had to answer when I started to write this book, or try to attempt to answer, is what is a capital city in antiquity? Because today we have diff we have quite sturdy definitions of what a capital is. It's usually the political centre for a country, but antiquity is a time before countries. Mm. Uh, when we talk about Tyre, we talk about Phoenicia, but Phoenicia was is was not a country in the way that we consider a country today. And so, what makes a capital has developed and changed drastically down the millennia. Um, so. And Tyre was a, I, I argue Tyre was a major cap, was a major capital for the influence it had on culture, 
Syracuse for the influence it had on ideas. It's one of the a very, like a great center of Hellenism mm. and for expanding Hellenism across the Mediterranean. And Antioch for being sort of the capital of uh, Roman provinces in the east, the capital of the Roman Orient. And then Carthage and Ravenna came came into the narrative as genuine capitals. Carthage as capital of the Carthaginian Empire, mm. and perhaps as the best example of a city that has experienced the Ozymandias effect, you know, one of the great, like, was of immense importance in antiquity and declined really into nothingness. Carthage is the only city that has not endured as a city with the name Carthage. Mm. Today, Carthage is just a suburb of Tunis. And Ravenna, perhaps close to Carthage, has greatest claim to be a clear-cut capital because it was the capital of the Western Roman Empire for close to 100 years in the 5th century and was a major uh, city it was, um, was the major power centre during the decline of Rome. And both of them were capitals of Byzantine exarchates. So what I like together. talking to historians for is that I ask you, why did you choose Sur? And you took me to thousands of years of history, which is actually quite important. In the introduction, if I'm not mistaken, you're in Syracuse when you decide to write this book. Mm. So it begins in Sur. Mm. And it actually begins in a way almost like, I mean, it's first-person narrative, and that you're taking us with you to Sur on the beach in the summer with a friend, Bashir, and you're in a way living his life in modern Lebanon, but you're able to trace back. Yeah, and I think one of the main things I wanted to do with this book is because I, you know, I'm the generation that I am. I'm in my 20s and I struggle with attention span very greatly. And I've never really enjoyed big dusty tomes of history that are fact after fact, date after date. They're very important and I had to wade through a lot of those to construct the narratives in this book. But what I wanted to do differently was intersperse it with with modern, with modern vignettes of modern life in these cities right. as a way of bringing the past and present into dialogue. And so my friend Bashir was very important to bringing the story of Tyre and sort of to, to life, if you like, because he was introduced to me by a friend who works for Unifil. And she was like, well, if you want to hear stories about Tyre, if you want to learn about how people relate to their heritage, you've got to meet this guy. And when I first said, sent him a WhatsApp being like, hi, so-and-so has suggested I talk to you. He said, okay, let's, let's go swimming and I'll show you, I'll show you our heritage. So, and that was, that was, you know, that wasn't really an artistic device. That was literally my way into talking about how some, not many, but some people in modern Tyre relate to the Phoenician history. And it started with the swim. So I, I put it in the book. Yeah. I, no, I love this. Actually, I love that beginning because it's today and you're automatically within maybe a minute or two when you're swimming out to sea, you see ruins beneath the water. There's actually a photo in the Instagram uh, collage of it's almost like a drone shot mm. i think it's the first or it's second a one shot, yeah. it's a drone shot <laughs> so the second photo on instagram you can actually see some of the roman columns mm -hmm. that are visible from above i actually didn't know that it's awesome yeah and yeah. that's something i really wanted to show because people today many i mean outside lebanon very few people would be able to point to tyre or sur on a map or yeah. carthage even they don't and trying to convince people that these are cities they want to learn or read about is, you know, is potentially, you know, it's, that's one of the challenges with a book like this, because they don't have the instant name recognition of Rome or Athens. Oh, yes, an important city of antiquity. And so you have to sort of persuade readers that these are cities that they should know more about. And I think the visuals are a huge, are a huge part of that, because, I mean, for me, I, I was struck by Ty. I mean, I came to writing this book in a way, both through this really terrible sailing trip in Sicily, which I do talk about in the introduction, but more because in the research of my first book, I came to Tyre and Antioch to research the Crusader periods in these cities. Uh -huh. And I'd read about the Crusader periods, but really not much else. And when I walked into Tyre, likewise with Antioch, with Antakya, I was just struck by how much antiquity there was so, so clearly accessible and visible around and, and not curated in the same way that the history, the archaeology is in Rome and Athens, and even in Carthage. In Carthage, it's well curated, but in Tyre mm. and Antioch, you sort of have the history in a very raw form. 
and that that there's something a bit magic about that you know if you look out at the sea entire you do see just roman and byzantine byzantine columns jutting out of the waves you go to, for a drink in a bar and there's an amphora in you know an amphora handle under the chair you're sitting on it's it's sort of everywhere and it's it really speaks to its rich past and even i mean it's anecdotal sometimes but i like it it's when you're you yourself are noticing an octopus <laughs> yeah. on mosaic or on old sort of Roman history, and it's injured yeah. because people want to eat calamari, calamari, and then you yourself have calamari. No, later. I don't. I'm oh, excited, but I don't have it. Okay. When I see how these octo octopodes are hunted, I'm like, nah, never. Octopodes? Never I've never heard like, this. Octopodes, I think. Is that it? I don't think people should say it, though. I think you sound yeah. really pretentious if you do, so I'd avoid it. Octopodes. <laughs> But that, those kinds of stories are great because they also remind me of the the very serious link. We're not going to get into the politics of it, the history of it, the serious links to the Phoenician era. Mm. And you mentioned something that I remember as an AUB student. When National Geographic arrived with their famous DNA test to see just how Phoenician Lebanese are. And the professor's name, was it F Philippe uh, Zalua? From Pierre Zalua. Pierre Zalua from NDU. Mm -hmm. right? So he's part of that. And I remember those tests being done. And then it's surprising that there's a high percentage of Lebanese that are still technically through that Y chromosome Phoenician. Yeah, they, it was about developing a way of tracing the Phoenician genotype and the sort, of ta the sort of tag, the genetic trace they found was this piece of Y chromosomal DNA. I'm not a geneticist, geneticist so I won't, I won't embarrass myself by going into more detail, but they, they called this the Phoenician genetic trace. Mm. And they tested people around the Mediterranean, not just on the Lebanese coast, right. but also yeah. in Carthage and other places. And they found the distribution of the gene around the Mediterranean was something like 6% everywhere. The Phoenicians got around. But in Tyre and also in Carthage, the, the ratio of the presence of this gene in the gene pool was like 30%. So it was significantly higher. And so that does give claim to, I mean, does give some gravitas to the claim that the Lebanese are you know, the genetic descendants of the Phoenicians. But what exactly that means is, you know, you have to be quite circumspect about that. And also, crucially, the people, from what I've read at least, and, and from conversations I've had, the people in Lebanon today who might identify as Phoenicians what choose to identify in that heritage, it's quite a long religious line, so who does and who doesn't. Mm. But crucially, the way this gene is distributed is not along religious lines. It's across the whole Lebanese population. So... It's not really, you can't really use this to sort of say, oh, yes, certain communities, the descendants of the Phoenicians and others aren't. It really is spread across the, the gene pool in Lebanon. So the disappointment is on both sides that we're all Phoenician. <laughs> well, 30% of you are. 30% of you are. Oh, 30% of men, I think. Uh, yeah. yeah, that was interesting too. I noticed that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, that didn't make sense to well, me. Well, Y chromosome, only the men would carry it. So maybe yeah. there's a my mitochondrial thing that you could trace in women. I don't know. Right. But they were ex uh, testing exclusively men. Mm. And what I thought was so funny is there was so much skepticism about injections in Lebanon around COVID and vaccinations. But when it was, let's test you for the Phoenicians, everyone was signing up, take my blood, take my blood. So it's like you can see the 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 levels of interest that this this project has with the population there's no immunity to finish <laughs> <laughs> there's no natural immunity no. but that that storyline begins with bashir himself your friend who identifies that way too yeah and i like the way he approaches it because he's he's literally looking at the sea mm. and he identifies with the sea mm. you also meet and i remember this his face on national geographic sherbel forgot his last name well his name is his name is actually something else but i changed it in the book just because often you have to change people's names okay, yeah in case they get mad and sue you i don't know like so he's it, that's not his real but name, he's yeah. quote the last phoenician exactly right very sunburned uh of the sea and proud of it very. he even shows you that national geographic issue from 2007 is it yeah, i mean how often does a cafe owner in Thai get like a major like full page spread in an international magazine of yeah. he's pretty proud yeah so let's use that as a segue mm. to go back in time to mm. ancient tyre and and phoenician tyre mm. could you describe what tyre would have looked like i know the bare minimum and i was reminded in the book that tyre was once an island mm. i actually forgot that 
I completely forgot that story. So let's go back in time to old ancient Tyre. Yeah, so I think, I mean, and as you mentioned with Bashir, when he talks about his connection to the Phoenicians, he talks about the sea and his love of the sea. And the sea is such a strong part of Tyre's identity and descriptions of Tyre all the way back to the ancient period, in particular, because not only was it this, the star, a major trading city, a maritime trading city, but also, well, everything was maritime in those days if you were trading, but also because, as you say, it was an island. And this is probably the most distinctive feature about ancient Tyre. Mm. Um, it had two magnificent harbours, one facing to the north towards Sida, was the yes. Sidonian harbour, one facing to the south towards Egypt, the Egyptian harbour. Mm. And these were highly sophisticated harbours. And crucially, also, the Phoenicians were known, I mean, and we should talk more about what a Phoenician is in short, but, you know, they were master architects. So when when Solomon is building the temple in Jerusalem, he requests architects from Tyre to come and design and build it using Lebanese cedar. So yeah. we know that the build we don't know exactly what shape these buildings took, but we know that they were highly sophisticated and well executed construction. Um, and also that they were multi-story, which was rare for these mm. times. And so yeah. this was it was highly sophisticated. And sources across the record, you know, from the Anastasi papyrus to cuneiform inscriptions to Greek texts, uh, describe Tyre as a city in the sea with walls of white stone that rise directly out of the waves. And this would be visually stunning today, how they built this. It, I mean, it's incredible to think, you sort of imagining these towers rising out of the waves. It's hard, It's difficult to imagine. The, the first photo in the Instagram collage, I think is the best depiction of what that island could have looked mm -hmm. like had it remained an island, because there is that section. And you can see the harbours in that drone right. shot. You the can North, see yes. the Sidonian harbour. Yeah. Um, and also... On thank, thank you, Beirut Motorbike. And also, Those damn Phoenicians. <laughs> <laughs> and also, on top of that, we have some really amazing descriptions from Herodotus, who, uh, you know, the father of history, a Greek writer from Halicarnassus, who basically comes on a tourism trip or pilgrimage, however you want to look at it, to Tyre, because he's heard of the beauty, the majesty of the temple of this deity known in the Greek period as Heracles Melkart, Heracles, Heracles Melkart, but originally to the Phoenician god Melkart. And he's heard of the sophistication of the temple, but also the richness of the decorations and the treasures inside, which include two pillars, one pillar uh, column made of pure gold, and the other that is, seems to be made of emerald like a mm. clean slab of emerald i've never heard of such a thing in in later writings and herodotus says he goes there and sees it so and you know whether or not we trust herodotus is a matter for a whole other podcast episode but it does speak to the wealth and glory of tyre and the fact that people are traveling from far away to, to see this ancient city so it must have really been something something spectacular for its time you touched this earlier and we will get into in a deeper way but the way that you identified, or you suggest that it's a, it's a capital mm. in its in its time. What does that mean exactly? Well, so because I know that, I mean, that word is there are arguments against. I mean, because I think one of the key things about the Phoenicians as a civilization is, firstly, that they would never have called themselves Phoenicians. So they never identified as a coherent single civilization. And Phoenicia certainly wasn't a country. So Tyre being a capital, I argue that Tyre is the Phoenician capital because of all the others. It's the it's the greatest and wealthiest metropolis and it retains its sort of isolated and distinct identity for the longest, in large part because it was an island. So when conquering armies, as we'll talk about soon, when, are, when conquering armies come down the Levantine coast, Tyre is the hardest city to capture and often retains its independence for longest or, you know, retains its own rulers, so on and so forth. So that's a reason that I argue that it's the most prominent of the Phoenician cities. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you're going to pick a capital, that's it. But at various points in history, Sida, ancient Sidon, does surpass it. They are rivals. Mm. Up the coast, you also have Byblos and Arawad and other Phoenician cities, which are of significant, great significance as well. So it's not the case that Tyre is without doubt the leading city of the Phoenicians across the Bronze Age, or even that Phoenicia is a recognizable sort of national entity. It isn't. It's mm. sort of a confederation of sometimes allied, sometimes warring cities. So it's the metropole of city-states. If that you, makes it kind of that capital. I think it's the, for me. I argue. I would call. I would argue that Tyre is a capital because it's the mother city of Carthage. So its influence on Mediterranean okay. history lasts longest. But also because I mean, yeah, it's it's wealth. It, 
is it's testified to for longest. So mm. it, it's the survivor of the Phoenician city state, certainly at that time. Yeah. So we'll get to Carthage in the second in half, because that's yeah. that, in a way it's it's the natural byproduct. Mm. Um, but let's go back a bit. You wanted to sort of delve a little into what Phoenician means or, or Phoenicia, just as a brief description. Yeah. Well, it's a really tricky term and there's no definitive answer to, to it. And different historians have different perspectives on this. And I can't distill that into a definitive answer. I think the most interesting historian to read currently about Phoenician identity is a historian, again, from the UK called Josephine Crawley Quinn, who specializes in this in this period and region. And she has an amazing book called In Search of the Phoenicians, where she really dissects what this term means and if we should even use it. And in Lebanon today, there's a lot of controversy around the term because of political reasons, yeah. and the way it's been appropriated. But also, and so often the things that some historians might refer to as Phoenician are just referred to as Canaanite or simply Bronze Age. So it is, it's a difficult term. I mean, as I've mentioned, the Phoenicians... The Phoenicians would never have called themselves this. This is a Greek term that lumps the men of Tyre, Sidon, Arwad, Byblos together for ease, essentially. But it's, what this term refers to is the traders of the Levantine mm -hmm. coast. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one of the main theories of the roots of the word is that it comes from the Greek word phoenix, which refers to this dark reddish color that maybe the hands of the Tyrians are stained because of the purple dye trade, which is their main, their major export, the purple dye that's extracted from the Murex sea snails and yes. used to dye the cloaks of the richest people. And we, we hear references to this across the historical record, even in Homer, in the Iliad, I think, I think Andromache, Hecuba offers a Tyrian robe, a robe embroidered by Phoenicians to Athena, a sort of tribute saying to preserve the life of her son. So we have... So so it's the Greek reference to these sea traders yeah. with loose relation to that purple dye. Mm. And that's really it. That's well, what... there are other theories as to what the word could refer to. I was, um, But we, I, the most widely accepted explanation is, is that. Mm. And the Phoenicians, crucially, would not have called themselves Phoenicians. They would have right. called... In the, in the inscriptions that we have, the existing epigraphy, they didn't, despite being credited with inventing the alphabet, they didn't leave much literature. But from the inscriptions that we have, they referred to themselves as sons of Tyre, Tyrians, right. not right. Phoenicians, or sons of Sidon, this sort of yeah. thing, rather than Phoenician. And Just the word itself, and remind me if I, is the name Sur older than Tyre? In terms uh, of Egypt? Is a, I think Tyre is a Latin, a, a, a Latinate w word for it. Sur, I think, is older, and it comes from the old Hebrew word for rock, right. which could, which probably referred to the island. So, okay. yeah. So, Sur and then Tyre in reference to, I guess it's Tyrus. Or? Tyrus is the mythical girlfriend of Melkart, who this is one okay. of the foundation myths, and she's also important for the story of the origin of the purple dye, hmm. um, because one of the myths associated with Tyre and the purple dye is that Melkart, the patron deity of the city, is walking on the beach with his girlfriend, the sea nymph type figure called Tyrus, and she's got her pet dog with her, and I think this is the earliest reference to a pet dog in sort of ancient literature. Uh -huh. And the dog runs off and comes back with all this red stuff coming out of its mouth. And she freaks out and thinks her dog's dying and it's bleeding from the mouth. And then it turns out that he's just bitten into a murex sea snail and his mouth is filled with this reddish purple dye. And then she's like, oh, great, I want to dress this color. And so then Melkart makes her dress in that color and the rest is history. In my limited travels, this is many years ago, I went to Malta. Mm -hmm. And that's the only place I've been where they're really celebrating their Phoenician past. Really? And almost in an aggressive way. Mm -hmm. So giant purple flags, every Phoenician museum you can imagine all over the place, they fully embrace it. Mm -hmm. I actually learned more about Phoenicia there than I've done here. How interesting. Yeah. Well, I guess because, like like I said, in, in Lebanon today, it can be a very loaded term. And so in the National Museum, a lot of artifacts that in Malta might be labelled Phoenician, here are labelled Bronze Age. Right. And there's no right or wrong answer to that. Um, Phoenician is a kind of spurious term that I think is, as academia moves forward, uh, the academic world will move away from because, as, as mentioned, that there was never a coherent self-identifying civilization by that name. It's, uh, it's used by Greeks. So this capital city-state, if you will, mm. Sur, Tyre, uh, emerges thanks to its trade. And it's an it's an it's economy is most important, I suppose, less to do with other things. Yeah, so I think the one of the defining 
one of the most interesting points about Phoenicians or the Phoenician culture, whatever we want to call them, is that they're traders, not conquerors. And that does mark them out distinctly in antiquity. So instead of traveling all over the Mediterranean, killing people and trying to, by, by military force, extend their influence, they do it much more subtly through trade. And as a result, their influence is much more pervasive. So, you know, we find Phoenician pottery from Lebanon across the Mediterranean as far as Spain, and we have Phoenician trading settlements that become powerful cities in their own right across the Mediterranean. And had they come with the mindset of conquerors rather than traders bringing something to the local economies, these, these are trading outposts would never have been permitted to form. They would never have grown. And they include cities like Marseille in France, that's mm. uh, Barcelona, Tangier, Cadiz, Carthage, Motia, cities in Malta, Palermo and Sicily. They're across the Mediterranean. So the influence is, is extreme. And also... Because of this trading influence, obviously, and the points that Tyre has independence, it's an incredibly wealthy city. And this, this leads to it being celebrated in literature. And you know, when we think about ancient cities, we think about them dominating the ancient world. And that is because ancient writers were kind of obsessed with the philosophical concept of the polis, because a city wasn't just the bricks and mortar for them. And they weren't even really like huge urban centers the way they are today, but they were the center of ideas. So, and as such, cities loom large in literature and Tyre, despite diminishing in importance, looms as large as many others. So we have in the Old Testament in, of the Bible that, you know, we have the prophet Ezekiel mm. talk using Tyre as the archetype, like the prime example of one of the wealthiest cities imaginable. And he likens the city to a treasure ship careening towards wreckage. And he uses all this very beautiful imagery to build, to explain and to communicate the wealth and the glory, the, the jewels of the Tyrians, the precious stones, the the amazing buildings, just and and the vanity of the Tyrians as well. And then he curses them and he predicts, or well, you know, he's writing contemporaneously, so is it a prediction? But he prophesies the destruction of Tyre by Nebuchadnezzar and things in this line. So we can see that's that's what Tyre is famed for, is this great wealth as a trading power. And also, I've as mentioned, Herodotus talks about the wealth of this temple. So yes, a phenomenally wealthy city. So that wondrous wealthy city-state walled off, protected mm. as an island. Fortified, yeah. Fortified. It, it transforms. Mm. And actually, sometimes it physically transforms. And some of that is due to war. Mm. Is it Alexander the Great that makes Tyre go inland? Through, through land bridge and... and so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Tyre, people often ask me how long Tyre's distinct identity lasts. And it's a really tricky question to answer because it actually does, to be honest, it continues well into the Roman period. You know, they're still trading Tyrian purple to the Byzantine times. Um, you still have temples, Heracles, Melkart, the cult of Melkart pervades even in Roman times. But really, if you're going to pick sort of decisive points, it's these two sieges, one mm. by Nebuchadnezzar, which has a sort of uncomfortable stalemate kind of victory for him whereby he sort of installs he gets a say in the next king and has some power but it's not a complete defeat despite it being a 13-year siege but then the major one the real turning point for me at least in my perspective as a historian is Alexander's siege of Tyre because I mean Alexander defeats the Persians at the battle of Issus we're in I think 333 BC 333 and then he sweeps down the Phoenician coast and he takes Sidon, Byblos, Arawad, all the other Phoenician cities, no contest, no issues, and gets to Tyre. And the Tyrians sort of want to negotiate with him because he's got an army of about 35,000 people. They don't. As I mentioned, they're merchants, not, not conquerors. Right. So they don't have this massive army just hanging out there. Also, mm. it's, a, it's a small, you know, it's a, it's a comparatively small entity compared to Macedon and Alexander the Great's empire. And so they try to negotiate with him. They send him a golden crown. They say, oh, we love you, Alexander. So great to have you here. Let's let's be friends. And he says, okay, I want to come and make a sacrifice in the Temple of Melkart within the walls of Tyre. And they say to him, um, no. And the reason for that is that they think this might be kind of some Trojan horse thinking. Like if Alexander gets access to Tyre by means of asking to make the sacrifice, maybe he'll then use that as a way to destroy it, bring them down from the inside. Mm. And the other thing is that the only people who are allowed to make sacrifices to Melkart in this temple are the kings of Tyre. So if they let Alexander do it, he becomes he's, they're basically acknowledged, they're basically sacrificing their sovereignty, which is not something they're yet prepared to do. Right. So Alexander says, right, let's go to war. 
And the Tyrians are like, good luck, mate. Like, we're on an island. You've got no boats. What are you going to do? Did and they, Alex, is that in recorded history, good luck, mate? No, maybe not. But <laughs> words, words to that effect. Words to that effect. <laughs> and, and so then Alexander really plays a blinder. And what he does is there's this other settlement just across the water. It's about half a mile apart. Mm. And he pulls down this other city, which he can capture. And then commands his men to throw the stones into the water and to build a land bridge. It's a crazy story. And you actually, you, you write it in detail. You're almost, it's almost like a journal, if you will, mm. of how Tyre is, is slowly losing its independence. Mm. It's being forced to join land. And this is a great metaphor for it. Exactly. Yeah. So the, 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 the thought of this city-state being independent... When does Tyre lose that status? I mean, at various points, that's an impossible, that really is an impossible question to answer. Mm. I mean, because it, it's independence waxes and wanes throughout history. So, I mean, it comes under, in the early years, it's very much under Egyptian influence. And you can very much argue that it's not independence of Egypt, that it is, it's under Egypt. Cert certainly strong influence, and, and but cert uh, certainly strong influence and possibly control, hard to say exactly. Mm. Um, and sometimes it looks like it's a, an alliance, but other times it really doesn't. Right. And then you see as Egypt uh, becomes disrupted by the Sea Peoples and other wars with Hittites, Amorites, etc., Tyre's independence grows in those periods where Egypt is under sort of difficult, is uh, okay, under experienced periods of difficulty. So the independence waxes and wanes. And then even you know, even under you know, our following the Muslim conquests and Arab Tyre, you see the city enjoying more independence than other states nearby. The same in Roman times, it's got an, it's got independent city status at various points. Mm. So really it, it go, comes and goes throughout history. And there's no one point, there's no one definitive point but that it loses its independence. But for me, when it's connect, connected to the mainland by Alexander, because yeah. that, that, that bridge that Alexander does eventually succeed in building, yeah. that is never eroded. Tyre is now a peninsula, not an island, and it's been the case since that time. I mean, for me, that is a defining moment where its fundamental identity as a city changes. And it will never again be unconquerable right. in the way that it was prior to Alexander's, uh, Alexander's capture of the city. Right. So that notion of a strong, independent city-state that can do several things. It can prevent, conquer, it, it can actually hold off mm. invasions. It, it loses over time, not right away. But its ability to simply focus on the sea only mm -hmm. fades. Indeed. And it's forced to deal with things that maybe Tyre was not interested in. Land problems, yeah. Or Saida, <laughs> Sidon, yeah. So those issues increase. But before that happens, Tyre gives birth. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> to its daughter, city-state, Indeed. Carthage. Exactly. And you reminded me in the book, and I hope I pronounced this right, Carthage actually means new city. Hmm. It's cart had Cart to dashed or something like that. Say it again. I mean, I can't pronounce Phoenician. No one can, but cart to dashed. It means new city. Cart hadash. So it's not a very original name, but yeah. But, so it literally means new city in Phoenician, if you will. And that's Tyre's claim to fame, if you will, that it's actually able to Tyre has many claims to fame, but that's one of them, yes. Okay, it's, 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 it's longevity continues on. <laughs> Certainly. Oh, no, I'm just a little bit defensive. I mean, people often refer to these as dead cities, and I, I, I take it very personally. So, mm. but no. Yeah, okay. so Carthage is one of, exactly, you're, you're completely right. It's, it's the most enduring legacy of, of Tyre. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, in like the 9th century BC, around the myth mythological foundation date is 814. 814. But, but actually, the archaeological record does back that up within a few decades. So, we'll go with that. And that's, sorry, that's before Alexander's arrival to Tyre. Yes. So, you're right. So, they're able to found that new city. Long before, long before the. Yeah. And actually, crucially, when Alexander is besieging Tyre, they send the women and children. They evacuate them from the island by ship to Carthage. Right. Um, they also apply to Carthage for aid, which Carthage does not send. Yeah. Mm. Um, but maybe they don't want to bring the wrath of Alexander down upon them. I wouldn't. So I sort I sort of get it. Um, and then yeah, Alexander crucifies most of the inhabitants of the city. So that's the other reason it's an end point. But yes, in around 814, the myth goes that we have the princess Alyssa of Tyre, who's the twin sister of Pygmalion, a recorded king of Tyre. And the story goes that Pygmalion is jealous of his sister and her husband who have a lot of wealth, and he kills the husband in an attempt to get gain access to the treasure, but he doesn't find it because it's hidden. 
And then the ghost of the husband comes to Alyssa and says, you've got to go. You're not safe. The treasure's hidden here. Take it and run. And she sort of, she uses a decoy method. So she loads a load of sacks full of sand or whatever onto a boat and sails off in one direction. So her brother thinks the boat, the treasure's going that way and is being thrown into the sea actually as a tribute to her husband. But in in reality, that's not a word we should use about myths, but in, in actual fact or whatever, she has loaded the treasure onto separate ships and she flees from Tyre, stops in Cyprus, picks up some women, whether with consent or not, history doesn't relate, sails on and eventually founds the city of Carthage. And the way she does that is she negotiates with local rulers for a piece of land and they sort of laugh at her this woman stumbling off this boat who wants to found a city. And they say, well, you can have as much land as you can cover with this ox hide. And they give her, you know, an animal skin. But then she stays up all night and she shreds it into one long ribbon. And she lays this ribbon around the base of what will become Bursa Hill. And there's apparently the myth says they're so impressed by how clever she was that they're like, okay, go on, have the hill. So sorry, she cuts the ox into smaller pieces, ties up the remnants and... Yeah, she makes it into a string. A and string. so that she can cov- cover... I mean, it, I guess it all depends on your translation or understanding of that word. But then she encircles Bursa Hill with it. Okay. And then Bursa Hill becomes the symbolic heartland center of Carthage. And mm. the Carthaginian Empire will basically expand from that point. There's a lovely painting yeah. in the Instagram collage. I think it's the fifth photo. It's a painting of that hill, mm. what it would have looked like back then. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, called Dido Building Carthage by by Turner. And sorry, these names are synonymous. Elisa and Dido. Oh yeah, sorry. So Elisa is the Phoenician name, and it's still very popular in Lebanon. Yeah. You meet a lot of Elisas, well, particularly in the south. Um, and so this this myth clearly has enduring popularity here. But yeah, the the theory is that Dido is a corruption of a Phoenician word meaning wanderer. And it's sort of an epithet given to her because she travels around the Mediterranean. But we call, you know, in the West, we call her Dido because that's the name Virgil gives her in the Aeneid. Mm. And Virgil's version of the foundation myth of Carthage sort of does Dido a disservice because in Virgil's version, yes, Dido builds this thriving center, this thriving city that Aeneas stumbles into on the way home from his defeat at Troy. And then Dido just falls head over heels in love with Aeneas, says, I'll make you king of Carthage. I'll do anything for you. Please stay with me. And it's, I mean, it's very moving and Virgil does a great job with it. You know, love the Aeneid, but it's not flattering to Dido. It makes, it takes away her agency and it has her completely lovesick. And at points it's kind of, it's, it's not what you think of a great queen as doing, right? Yeah. Um, But the other, there are other versions of this myth that predate Virgil's telling of this story, which is very much anti-Carthaginian propaganda. And in the other versions, Dido, yes, founds the city and does an incredibly good job founding it, expanding it, and then is asked to make a political marriage to a, a local lord who she doesn't love. And she says she'd rather not because she's dedicated to her first husband's memory, the first husband who was killed in Tyre. And then her hand is sort of forced. So she says, okay, I'll do this, but I've, I want to make a sacrifice to my husband first. And she builds up a great pyre, burning sacrificial animals and so on. But then at the end, tricks them and throws herself into the flames and kills herself rather than marry someone else. So again, it's not a happy ending for Dido and it still ends in, you know, self-immolation. Um, but it's it's slightly more dignified than Virgil's version. And so. just remind me, the story of Elisa Dido is complete myth. Well, yeah, I mean... if foundation myths they're hard to discern i mean but what i would say about the foundation legends of carthage is i don't know of any other ancient foundation legends which have a woman founding a city right and with that in mind you could argue that there's potentially some basis in fact because this is not a lot of foundation myths are literary tropes right a lot of them follow a similar a similar story arc they bring in similar themes but the foundation myth of Dido is quite unique in that it's mm. a powerful woman. Um, and that's not something that ancient writers tended to make up right. because they liked it. That was quite an- an- antithetical to philosophy of the time. So maybe, but no, there's no proof. There's no proof anywhere. No. My knowledge of Carthage is mostly its defeat. Yes. And actually, I say this as somebody who goes on YouTube at night and just looks up Carthage sometimes out of curiosity. I rarely think about its history. I think of its, its century-long 
Punic Wars. But this is the ultimate triumph of the Roman propaganda machine that right. so many thousands of years later, when you think of Carthage, you think loser. I mean, all you think of is defeat. Exactly. So this yeah. is the triumph of, of Roman propaganda. Right. And I think, you. I mean, it's it's, it's mentioned in the book uh, in different ways that it's it's the narrative of the the, the victor. Mm. Clearly, Carthage's voice is lost at sea. Completely extinct. Well, lost in fire, actually. Lost in a fire. Completely burned. So... so We'll get to it. But they did love burning stuff. So, I mean, fair. I know an Elisa in my building that's a bit crazy too. She, she burns likes, stuff. She likes to burn her boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> no She's going to be that. listening to this. So no she, 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 I can get away with it. <laughs> with love. <laughs> Passion. So what is Carthage most famous for if it's not its defeat? Well, it is most famous for its defeat. But what it should be famous for are the things that came before and after that. Um, so Carthage really thrives and it becomes one of the great powers of the Mediterranean in the sort of in the in the centuries prior to its defeat. So I, I think I'm really bad at dates, I warned you of this. And this is one that should be actually in my mind, but it isn't. But I think it's around no I'm not gonna say the date of its destruction, but it's it's the it's it's the early centuries BC. Mm. Um I think one four seven, but that might be the truceless war. I muddle them. Um but it's mostly famous for this definitive sack by Rome at the end of the Third Punic War, where R Rome does defeat Carthage, it comes in and it's a real act of genocide and ethnic cleansing on a grand scale, because not only do they kill everyone they can find in the city, so they burn the city. And then when the city is burned, they send killing squads in on rotation. So there's 24-hour killing going on, and anyone who has survived the fire is killed with swords or whatever in the street. So the like most people who are in the city at the point of its fall are murdered. And there are a lot of people in the city at the point of its destruction because until the point of its destruction, that was the safest place to be because that was going to be the last stronghold. So if you were a Carthaginian citizen living outside Carthage, you would run and hide behind the fortified walls of Carthage. And also they put out like a bat signal for everyone able to bear arms, come and take up arms to defend. This is the last stand of the, the country. So just before we get into its, mm -hmm. its uh, uniqueness, let's say, but the the, is is it fair to assume the difference between Tyre and Carthage is that Carthage is a military legacy? It's yeah. fortified. It's and it's fighting. Tyre is not that kind of story. It's more of trade and power through economy. Well, so this is an interesting point. So C Tyre, like Carthage, is a fortified city that defends itself against invaders. But mm. the crucial, yeah, crucial difference in the way that Punic, which is the word we used to refer to Carthaginian culture, the way that Punic culture develops, is it develops as uh, culture of yeah military strength and conquest and yeah. they, they carve out an empire so they're not just trading with other places around the mediterranean they conquer into you know there's a whole region called barkid spain which is the area of spain conquered conquered by sort of hannibal's family the barkids and they also conquer large swathes of northern africa and large chunks of sicily so they're an imperial an imperial yeah. minded culture. So, so tyre remains a city-state even though it's a capital mm. carthage is an empire. Carthage is much. The city of Carthage is much more a capital by the modern stretch of the word. In I that, see. there's a huge, there's an empire around it, and that is the political center yeah. and center of control of that empire. So, in the way that we understand the word capital today, Carthage is absolutely a capital in the conventional modern I sense. Okay. Whereas Tyre, I, you can argue it's a capital more in that the influence it has right. in the spread of culture across the Mediterranean. Okay. So yeah, let's go back to. What makes Carthage famous? So yeah, so the siege and the Romans kill everyone and they burn the library and so and crucially they take control of the narrative about Carthage's history. Mm. So a lot of most of the texts that we have about Carthaginian civilization are hugely unsympathetic and negative because Rome's mission was to destroy Carthage's reputation, with the exception, perhaps of the way Hannibal, who is sort of the hero, anti-hero of the Second Punic War, is presented because they don't just say, oh, he was a, they don't just say, oh, he was a rubbish general. They actually, you know, big him up as, as a, as a proper rival for Scipio. So they, they, they are quite complimentary in their depictions of Hannibal. Mm. And he's still revered as one of the great generals of antiquity. And the reason they're sort of generous with the way he's presented is, in the Second Punic War, Carthage very nearly destroys Rome. And the, you know, the argument goes that had Hannibal decided to attack Rome at sort of the end of his sort of Italian uh, expedition, I forget the exact word, but at the end of his time, his wars in Italy, had Hannibal decided to attract, uh, attack Rome instead of not, the Roman Empire might never have developed to be take center stage of the Mediterranean and history that it did. So the second battle was close. 
Oh yeah, it was very close, but then it still results in a resounding defeat. I, I, the not Union. the exact year, just remind me, because I'm forgetting now, mm -hmm. which years that is, the Punic Wars? which, which... Uh, Like 2nd century BC. 2nd century BC, okay. 1st, 2nd, yeah. like they, they take quite place across a, like they're very long, these series of wars, they're sort of yes. 20 years at a time sort right. of thing, so it's not, not one quick battle. But you did something interesting, rather than dwelling on the wars you actually dwell on the inter years yeah because yeah. i think as as you've pointed out what carthage is most what what people know most about is the punic war are the punic wars yeah um and so i that i didn't think was a particularly new or original angle to really go into depth on in this book and my focus was not on the Carthaginian Empire, but on the city of Carthage. And so what I wanted to look at was the impact these wars had on the development of the city and what happened in Carthage between the wars. And what one of the episodes that I think is as interesting as the First Punic War, for example, is the sort of interbellum period between the First and Second Punic War, where we have what's called the Truceless War or the Mercenaries War, mm. which is when... So the First Punic War ends in resounding defeat of the Carthaginians, but surprisingly they're, they're, surprisingly they're defeated at sea. And the First Punic War is essentially a battle for control of Sicily. So the ship, the Carthaginian navy, is defeated decisively at many naval battles around Sicily. But the armies of mercenaries that they have actually posted in Sicily are not defeated. So places like Lilibaeum, you have a big army um, of successful soldiers. You have not lost, they, they were tasked to defend Lilibaeum and they've, they've defended it, and it's still there. And at the end of the war, they're told, okay, you need to surrender now and come back. But this puts Carthage in a very difficult position because sort of Treaty of Versailles-esque, they sort of, there are all these terms to their surrender at the end of the First Punic War. So they have to agree to accept war guilt and pay Rome's war expenses and ransom their hostages at market price while giving the Romans their hostages back for free and so on and so forth. So it's an economically crippling defeats for Carthage. And not only that, but they've just funded 20 years of war, which is expensive. So, so they're broke. But before we get into maybe the afterlife of Carthage, mm. what would life have been like in Carthage at its height? I, and the reason I ask it this way is because in a way we're lucky, even though it's not the same story, but you can still go to Sur mm. and at least feel what it would have been like to be on that island. Mm -hmm. Carthage today is a suburb of Tunis, and it's just ruins. It's not, I mean, I guess I'm trying to ask, was it as bustling, let's say, as Rome in those years? Was yeah. it as vibrant? 100%. So it was, co competing it was competing on that scale. For, Rome, for sure, it was. For sophistication, because you've got to remember the Carthaginians are the successors of the Tyrians. So they bring with them their skill with architecture. They bring with them their, their skill for building ships, for trade. Um, and they then it develops into this slightly this military edge, and they start conquering territory as well, which brings wealth. So they're hugely wealthy cities, again with very sophisticated harbors. Carthage famously has two harbors, one of which is circular, which is crazy. It's yeah. it's, it's very uncommon, and it's yeah. sort of an inland harbor built into a bay, like beyond the first one. And that harbor is built is used primarily for shipbuilding. It's a very very wealthy city, and certainly a hive of activity. Mm. So now the afterlife it gets destroyed. And you mentioned it's burned, it, ethnic cleansing, it's your, your words. There's even the, um, I mean, there's great, I, I've spent so much time watching these animation videos of Carthage's fall, mm -hmm. and it's even become part of video games, and, and you can play with Carthage a lot. Mm -hmm. Even sometimes you can try to win and send Hannibal to Rome and defeat Rome, which is the alter universe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the afterlife, what does Carthage look like after it's conquered? Well, so it's burned, so sort of black, miserable place. And the Romans are very thorough in their destruction. So they, they literally cut the top off Bursa Hill. So Bursa Hill is the symbolic center. It's where the temples are. And Rome literally burns down the temples, crushes them, and then cuts the top of the hill to create a, a major plateau. And then they pull out after burning the city. So it's just ruins. And then we have this weird period where it's just a ruined area and one Roman general is apparently sent there to sulk and think about his failures, but it's a really desolate barren landscape and just the ruins of the city for about a hundred years. But then Caesar, in a way to sort of battle overcrowding in Rome, says, 
I want us to resettle Carthage because it's actually in a very important strategic location. So he sends, I think he asks for 80,000 Romans to be sent there to resettle. That doesn't happen. Maybe 10,000 go in the first wave, but they do found a prosperous Roman colony and it will grow. It will grow to become one of the major cities of North Africa again. It will, the other major city there is Utica. It will surpass that. Um, and then it has renewed importance as an early Christian center. So it has a very important it plays an important role in the history of early Christianity. So just to be clear, that's not Tunis. That's still Carthage. That's still Carthage. Okay. Tunis is the city built following the Arab conquests. So, And then Carthage is destroyed again. And the stones of Carthage are carted to the other side of the lake to build Tunis. And the reason for that is that the conquerors think that Carthage is too exposed to attacks from Sicily, which they haven't managed to conquer yet. So then they move, they basically move and rebuild a new capital, but with the stones of Carthage. So there's some continuation, but... I, I didn't know this. Post-Arab conquest, Carthage dies once more. Yeah, Carthage is really finished um, following the 7th century. It doesn't really make a comeback. I mean, oh, no. No, that's later. Sorry, I muddled up my chronology. But yeah, following the, the build of Tunis, Carthage is, is not important as a city again. It doesn't mm. revive until Tunis expands and spreads and then it begins to incorporate the land that was Carthage into modern Tunis. That's interesting. Mm. So if we could tie in these two cities together... These are both capitals, maybe different versions of that word over time, but they serve that function in their prime, and then they die. Mm. Now, they don't die in a sense that, I mean, you can still go they to the... Contract. They, they, they contract. They change. Fundamental transformation, yeah. Better <laughs> words than I can choose, yes. But I like that. Fundamentally transformed. Carthage and the last four or five photos in the Instagram collage are literally ruins. Mm. The first five photos of Tyre are not the same story. It's a different place. Mm. But in your best estimate, what makes these cities rise and fall? Um, well, through all the cities I talk and I discuss in the book, and there are five, all of them undergo this fundamental transformation. They're for different reasons. So a major one is conquest. So uh, Carthage falls because of conquest it's very literal it's very you know i say you if you ask me to pick a moment in tyre's history where it loses its independence i can't give you a clear answer but with carthage i can yeah it's the roman conquest that's when carthage really loses its carthaginian punic identity and declines and unlike and, tyre it's not burned to the ground it's not cleansed of its inhabitants oh no unlike i mean carthage is but tyre exactly, exactly yeah. tyre isn't exactly right right okay um tyre tyre changes because the trade routes change. So Tyre is important originally, A, because it's an island, and that changes, the landscape changes. And also because it's a major hub and center of trade. But as other civilizations develop their sort of trading muscles and other trade routes emerge, then Tyre's importance wanes and right. wealth is diverted through other cities and it just declines. And so its primary function changes too. Tyre yeah. serves that yeah, and then serious it role in trade and it doesn't later. Oh, and it, it has periods of comeback. So in the Crusader period, Tyre is a major trading port. Mm. But then the Mamluks, when they finally drive, when the Mamluks finally drive the last traces sort of the Christians out of the east, they sack Tyre very thoroughly. And it doesn't really come back from that until, yeah. and for a long time, there's no city there. It's just a small fishing, fishing village. And it's only in recent decades that Tyre has really developed into a big urban. I can't entity. remember where it is in the book. It may be in that chapter in Tyre where it's. Fakhr al-Din, mm. who wants to revive Tyre. Yeah, he's like, needs sort of a, a, a revival for a time, but then yeah. he, he, uh, he dies yeah, before it happens. Yeah, wanes and Tyre's yeah. revival sort of halts there until more modern times. So trade and conquest, these two things. So these two cities are yeah, very interesting. important. Yeah. Mm. Well, we're not going to get over, we're not going to cover the other three cities. Mm -hmm. We will touch a bit on Antioch, Antakya, and this book is published recently, last yeah. few months, but the earthquake in Turkey is also recent history, and I'd like you to talk about that as much as you can, maybe in terms of heritage and preservation and also losing it on the way. Yeah, I mean, so the most difficult part about writing this book was the earthquakes in Antakya. I was very, very upset by it and very invested because I'd spent a lot of time in Antakya in the months prior to the earthquake, and I had friends in the city, and I knew the city well. Um, and I think like many people here, I woke up when the earthquake happened because we felt it a bit here. 
Um, but then I went. You were here at the time. Yeah. The- but then I went back to sleep. Um, woke up again in the morning, looked at the news, and was like shocked and stunned. And at first, I thought Antioch, Antakya hadn't been badly affected because news reports, what the first news reports weren't about uh, Antakya. They were about Marash. They were about Antep. Yeah. They were about different. They were about Urfa. They weren't about Antakya. And then I realised that that was because Antakya was actually one of the worst affected cities, and Antakya was thoroughly levelled by this earthquake. Um, and then I had to hoik the book back from publication because it was actually just being print about to be printed at this oh, time. Dear. We'd submitted the final, edited everything, and we had to pull it back and I had to redraft that chapter because as with mm-hmm. Tyre, I write about the, the present day as well. And all of a sudden, it wasn't true anymore. I couldn't say Antakya has a thriving Jewish community. That community was destroyed. I couldn't say the Greek Orthodox Church, like my descriptions of it, they weren't true. The Greek Orthodox Church was destroyed. I couldn't talk about the mosque of Habib al-Napa. It was destroyed. So all this stuff, all these things I had. So basically I had to go there and basically see which of these buildings remains and had been destroyed. And I waited two weeks because I didn't want to be in the way. I didn't. I wasn't doing first wave reporting. And I also thought it would be safer with our aftershocks to go two weeks later. But I was wrong because another a major aftershock, like 6.4, yeah. a new, or even a new quake, I can't even remember, but happened while I was there. And it was obviously incredibly frightening. As only be, And it was the epicenter was Antakya. So it was very frightening. Um, but it did definitely put me in, give me a shared common experience with, historians who've written about the earthquakes of Antioch because, you know, the earthquake in Antakya, while tragic and no one could have predicted it's, well, I don't, I don't believe anyone could have predicted its timing exactly, but the idea of a major earthquake hitting Antakya is not a surprise. This has happened numerous times down the centuries, down the millennia. I mean, it happened here. Yeah, we have like, you know, we have reports of the Emperor Trajan escaping through a window in the uh, 115 AD earthquake of Antakya. We then have recordings by a, a, a Greek writer called John Malalis of the the earthquake that struck Antakya in 526. These major quakes that have destroyed the city happen like clockwork almost. Mm. Um, and they're always major and devastating. And Antakya has very few historic buildings still standing because from the ancient period, even though it was a major Roman capital, because of these earthquakes, very little remains. But what Antakya does have on a monumental scale, is mosaic floors. And you can see the history of the earthquakes in these floors. They're like this. They're not flat mosaics. You can see how the ground has moved underneath them. But that heritage is still preserved. And one of the great travesties of the earthquakes was that recently built government buildings, like the Antak- like or government-sponsored buildings, like the Hatay Archaeological Museum, survived pretty much intact. You know, it's a major glass building. The glass didn't even crack, but all the buildings around it are completely destroyed. So... The heritage, the heritage that survived the previous earthquakes still survives. The museum didn't collapse, but everything else and a huge loss of human life around it is gone. So it's it's in the book. It's the last city mentioned mm-hmm. of the five. Oh, just two more points before we take a small break. Uh, the kind of storytelling you deliver, in addition to that book I mentioned earlier by Celine Deringo, The Ottoman Twilight, uh, there's a book that it also remind. Uh, there's a film it reminded me of called Wine and War. Okay. It's by Michael Kedem. He's actually he was a guest here a few months ago. He's a wine writer, mm-hmm. but he loves archaeology. And the movie actually starts. You're close to Tyre. There's a drone shot, and you can see the ruins beneath the seabed. And then suddenly you're in Phoenicia, mm-hmm. and then you're finding the wine. Uh, the winemakers of thousands of years ago. It's primarily about wine and antiquity. But I know that there's archaeology that's still happening today mm-hmm. in Tyre. So can we touch on that briefly? Yeah, I mean, this, the story of Tyre's history is subject to development um, because new discoveries are made all the time. And most crucially, I think maybe it was last summer, there was a new temp- the discovery of a new temple announced by archaeologists from the universities of Warsaw and Barcelona. And what's really striking about this temple, which I don't think is in all the public reports yet, but it's a temple dating from the Roman period, but built in Phoenician style. 
And many of the archaeologists working on the project believe that this is the Roman temple of Heracles Melkart, which is a major discovery. And the reason for this, well, one of the reasons, you know, they're oh, not... Sorry to interrupt. Is that one of the photos that was... No. No, it's unrelated. Alas, no. Okay. Um, it's a really messy site. It's mm. not super photogenic. It's an archaeological dig in progress, so that's right. not yeah. fully not fully rendered. But one of the reasons that they think this could be the Temple of Melkart is one of the crucial rituals of the Phoenician god Melkart, the Tyrian god Melkart, is the Ejersis of Melkart. And that is the... He's, he's considered a sun god. And each year... There's this ritual where, and it's very, it's got eerie parallels, um, where he dies and is entombed and rises again on the third day, is resurrected. So this is a story in this part of the world for as long as time. And a key part of the enactment of this ritual each year is this tomb underneath the temple. And in the new temple they've discovered, there's an empty tomb in the, under the main hall of the temple. So this this could be seen to indicate that this is the Temple of Melkart. So that's a major discovery. That's just last year. Uh, they've been working on it for a few years, but they only, they announced it to the press last year. But it was all over the it was all over the newspapers. It was it's a major discovery, and that's an important discovery because once again it comes into the discussion of the identity of Tyre persisting um, and the the older Phoenician identity because a temple from the Roman period built in the Phoenician style that shows a continuation of the religion and of the cult of Melkart well into the Roman period. So that's an important piece of evidence if they can demonstrate this. So the, the, story, is still, the story is still unfolding. So there's a sequel to this book eventually, I guess. Well, not by me. There are lots of really <laughs> amazing archaeologists writing on this stuff. And I would actually, I would say, if you really want to learn about the cult of Melkart and the Phoenician period in Tyre, my book, I hope, is a nice introduction to that. But there's... A lot more. There's a lot more to be read by by Lebanese professors and yeah, many many writers. And a final point. There's another book, Queens of Jerusalem. Yeah. Let's touch on that because I know these two books are related. Hmm. I didn't have time to read Queens of Jerusalem. That was my fault. We both know, but yeah. no, no, it's right, but it's also for sale here in Alias. Uh, yeah, let's talk about the linkages between these two books. So Queens of Jerusalem was my initial journey into writing about the Middle East. And there, you know, there are things I I take it to a broader scope now if I was doing it again, but I was very young when I started writing that book. Um, and it was about women in the Crusader period. So powerful women rulers, uh, Queens of Jerusalem, Princesses of Antioch, Countesses of Tripoli, Countesses of Edessa, um, you know, consorts at the court of Damascus. And I wanted to look at what women powerful aristocratic women were doing in the crusader period because the, cru the, the crusades is like this hyperactive field of study there are new books all the time but they always overlook the roles played by women and i thought this was something i really wanted to change because because the men kept dying during the crusades women ended up with a lot of power because there was a shortage of brothers uncles nephews whatever mm. to take over from the kings and princes who were killed in battle or died of leprosy or whatever else so the women ended up having an awful lot of political power at this time. So I wanted to write about that. And how this book led to led to Twilight Cities was that, yeah, I visited Antioch and Tyre and Tripoli as part of my research for these books. And I was just blown away by the layers of history that were so clearly visible. And I wondered, why haven't I learned more about these cities? You know, I love history. I'm interested in the ancient world. Why haven't I read more about Tyre? Why haven't I, like these mosaics that I'm seeing in Antioch, why haven't this is clearly one of the great metropolises of the Roman world? Why haven't I read more about that? So that's so that, how these cities. That curiosity for antiquity stems from research in, during the Crusader era. I mean, I'm a medieval like I'm a medievalist by by training. By uh, my, my, I love the medieval period, mm. and that's why I'm so shaky on ancient dates. Like even the ADBC stuff, like under pressure, I'm like ah, like. But I, I, yeah, the Middle Ages are really what I'm interested in. Well. You're a meticulous writer. The dates are all, I think. The dates are in the book. So yeah. Any dates that you've heard me say out loud, I would check. Right. But they're there. So and or Wikipedia. It's usually okay. Yeah, I'd love if you cited Wikipedia everywhere for this book. No, <laughs> no I don't think so. More authors <laughs> should, like, because everyone, if they need to do a quick date check, they'll go to a Wikipedia timeline. And yet no one ever puts it in their bibliographies. And it's it's very it's very snooty. You know, I'll say the first chapter in particular, because that's here in Lebanon, it made me go to Tyre and drive for a bit and just remind myself that Tyre is very short it's drive away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to be fair, I don't go there that much. Mm. And you hint at this briefly in the book too. It's almost the reluctance sometimes of going to the south, mm. which is it's true. 
there is that psychological hesitation. Uh, Tom Young, if he's still here, I don't know if he's still sitting. Yes, he did an exhibition inside, though. Uh, I think it's still going on. Everyone should go. Oh, it's still going on. <laughs> it's on. That <laughs> and it's free. Anything else, Tom? <laughs> There's music. So that That's was a great repurposing of a hammam space. It's great, but, great, great. And yeah. maybe I'm a bit, maybe it's more to do with me. That was the first time I went to Saida in years as well. Saida is 30 minutes away. 40. So it is an hour, maybe 10 minutes or so. And the beaches are beautiful. It's lovely to swim there. And it's been many years I haven't gone. So this book actually took me on a, on a brief road trip to the south. I love the South. I mean, and I hate I hate to generalize. I mean, when I first arrived in Lebanon, I was staying as um, Lebanese flatmates who were very snooty about the South. It was, why would you go there? And I, I don't know if that, I don't know if there's this general uh, hesitancy that you talk about, but that's what I experienced. But, but I just, I loved my trips to the South because I found if I went to Byblos and Batroun and places like this, I was so surrounded by you know, other people like me, sort of expats recently arrived and just, it was very wealthy and it seemed, you know, it was just very, um, you know, it wasn't such a culture trip as going to the South was. And I found in the South, people were so keen to talk about the history of the cities. And I also just, I've just, just it was just so welcoming. And yeah, and, and yeah so my, my, my favorite places to visit and that it's always going to be tired for me in heaven. And, but. and even though it's not the focus of this exchange, but you're not shy to talk about your own feelings too, which I like that. Mm -hmm. The hospitality, the warmth, and also current events that in a way you're, there's one moment where you're sleeping in a bed and thinking how much recent history has passed through the same location. Yeah. And it's only decades ago. Mm -hmm. So you're not shy to touch on that too, which I liked. Mm -hmm. I really like the first person narrative of this book. Because I'm able to see Sur through your eyes too, and it took me back. It actually forced me to go back. I'm really pleased because if if there's one thing this book does, if it gets people to travel and see these cities, and also maybe even bring you know more income streams into Tyre, then that's that's a fantastic thing. And just to reawaken interest in these cities is the yeah. the, the ultimate goal. So, so it's a British painter and a British historian that takes me south rather than north. <laughs> we love the south. What can yeah. I say? Yeah. <laughs> So, well, let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll open it, open it to an audience Q&A. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Q&A, ask Catherine anything you'd like. Anything. <laughs> no, with, with caress. Um, <laughs> and we can focus on the other three cities as well. We don't need to focus on Tyre and Carthage. But I want to mention before we start the Q&A, uh, I think there are no more physical copies of Twilight Cities in Antoine. I don't know. I hope there are, but... Call them if you want a copy. I don't know if we're sold out here tonight. I guess we are at in, in Alias as well. I think so. Okay. Call Antoine. Tell them you want more copies. Or you can buy mine for $1,000. <laughs> She'll sign it as well. <laughs> I, I, have, I have three copies in Lebanon, but they're for sales. <laughs> Split the commission. Yeah, sure. Okay. $500 for you, right? It's not worth that much. <laughs> so, let's open it up. Any questions to start? About Phoenicia, about Sur? Is there anyone? The lady in the middle. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Could you just introduce yourself, what you do, who you are? Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm, I work for Human Rights Watch. Um, I had a question about how Sur became an, from, went from an island to 
not an island because as you were talking i was looking at google maps and it's quite thick actually yeah. the land that kind of connects what turned it into a peninsula i guess um so how did that develop did it just kept getting built over over time like i'm trying to picture in my head was it really an island yeah how no, did that it's happen a good question um because it is it's kind of hard to believe but tr there's enough textual evidence that it definitely was an island and at that alexander's causeway connected it and you know it's tradition to say that at the land bridge that alexander built was the final you know is is the basis of the the isthmus that we have now that sort of land bridge connecting it and i'm sure that there's no reason to doubt that so that is probably true but the bridge that alexander built probably only a handful of meters wide you know not like a kilometer wide or you know nothing like what it is now that's just geography that's just over time when you have it's just silted up with sand and because the sea's no longer passing through it this debris rocks everything is now being caught by those rocks, by that bridge, and it, it builds up over time, it silts up. And you see similar things. I mean, so another one of the cities that I talk about in the book is Ravenna. When Ravenna was built, it was made up of waterways, like canals, like Venice, and it was a coastal city. Now the coast is like a 15 minute drive from the city because just over the centuries, it's silted up and sand, has, sand and rocks have stopped there. So it's, it's, it's changing geographies. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, 2000 and a bit years ago. So it's been building up for, for a very long time. Yeah. So just slow progression. Really. Yeah. I would never know that going today. You couldn't. Yeah, you'd never think. I mean, when you go into the old city, you kind of feel you can get a sense of the island. Like when you go to the tip of the peninsula, you yeah. do sort of still have sea on three sides going around. So you sort of get a sense of it. But I never, when I'm walking from like Almina archaeological site to the Hippodrome archaeological site on either end of of the isthmus i never realized i'm walking across a bridge like a friend was like oh we can stand on alexander's causeway and i'm like sure you can but you won't really have any impression of doing that because it's now such a broad piece of land yeah what was the f distance from the island itself to the mainland hard to say exactly but about half a mile like yeah so something what like 600 700 meters or so something like that yeah i'm not good at metric imperial but they say about half a mile yeah just over half a mile close to a kilometer Close to a kilometer. Like probably between. Actually, just bring yeah a little closer. Close to a kilometer. Less than a less than a kilometer, but but not far off. But yeah. But that's surprising at how hard it was to actually conquer Tyre. It's not that far away. Well, if you don't have boats, how are you going to do it? How would you do it? I know. Yeah, you. you I don't with, want to conquer. You have, but you have your armies and the cities. I have of an army. In this hypothetical scenario, I'll take dragons. Okay, the dragons would do the trick. Yeah. That, that's a novel that'll be written. Dragons of time. I think actually it's been done several <laughs> times. Yeah. Well, but thanks for that question. Are there any others? Um, I don't want to say any question, but I, I'd like to add something funny for what you said, Catherine, that in Lebanese slang, we said something like, Badiballit al Bahar. Yani, ruh ballit al Bahar. And this slang comes from Alexander when he comes to. To, 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 to put all these rocks to uh, have uh, the wheels to go into Tyre because they don't have the ship and they, they don't know how to have this fleet to enter the uh, Tyre fleet. That's so this is very, very, very funny. And it's my, my information is based on historical info. Historical here lives in Lebanon, Dr. Antoine and Dr. Youssef. And there is a lot of historian that agrees on this slogan from where this Lebanese slogan comes from, Alexander the Great, when he comes and to, to, to cuff Tyre. Oh, ballet al bahar. Ruh ballet al bahar. What, what is, what does ballet mean? Ballet, that means put the tiles on. And blot. So, yes, blot, I mean, blot, ballata. And, and blot, that word would go back far enough to blot, it's, it's the, the, the jazer, we said in Arabic language, this jazer of the, the word is ballata, hey. but it's Phoenician. It's Phoenician. Yes, really. because it's the mother of the language, mm -hmm. the semantic language, mm -hmm. kind of. So Alexander, uh, I want to tile the sea to enter Tyre. But it's not, it's not a hundred percent. version of history. Oh, yeah. And also yeah. just like it's the, it's the fact that it's a major impossible undertaking. Yeah. 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 Alexander did exactly. it. Exactly. And that's one of the interesting things I, alas, do not speak. Arabic, but one of the things I was told by friends when I was thinking about Alexander the Great in Tyre is I was told that in Arabic, we don't, you don't call him the Great. He's not Alexander the Great. He's yeah. called the Horned One or something. Is the, what, what, how would you refer to Alexander the Great in, in Arabic? Alexander. Alexander okay. al-Azim. 
لا but that's not no that's المقدوني. that's the translation of لا ألكسندر المقدوني المقدوني من from Macedonia okay Macedonia okay, so مقدوني different ones but I was told that he had more negative connotation right here because he's an invader so he's an invader um, but now I have a question Catherine don't don't you think Before that this question could you just introduce yourself I'm sorry um, my name is Lamis Shker I'm a writer so and media producer. So um, don't you think that there is a lot of stories and Hollywood movies and uh, a lot of uh, uh, books maybe talks about the fall of uh, uh, Sparta or the fall? Don't you think it's time to to do something for for the fall of Tyre? I I mean, well, because the fall of Tyre is not such... Because it takes seven months. And you yeah, have- so I, I think there has recently, I mean, not that recently, but there's been a terrible movie made about Alexander the Great um, starring yeah. Colin Farrell, and it's just awful. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's unwatchable, actually. And Angelina Jodie plays his mother and all this. And I think that has really... De- that has No, no, that, that's... Uh, yeah, and that, I think, has really deterred people from making films about Alexander the Great. Uh, I think they've seen that, and it's a cautionary tale of what not to do. But I would love to see a film set in Tyre, a set about the history of Tyre. For sure. <laughs> That's the name of the movie. <laughs> it means step off. Mm-hmm. Get the lost. Yeah. Anyway. Are there more questions? No, it's impossible. Yeah. No, no other questions, really. That's fine by me, yeah. No, no, no. no. We're no just staying longer. No. <laughs> Were there any others? No? Any questions? That's just fine. Don't worry. And that's all, yeah, Rupin. One more question. Yeah, it's back here. Oh, there's another one? Yeah, please, please. I don't want to monopolize, but I was really interested and I have another question. Hit me, yeah. Um, I found it really striking when you said that basically the story of Queen Dido had been repainted because of Roman propaganda and that 2,000 years later, we're still reiterating this propaganda and it's just incredible to me that the effects of it can last so long. Are there any other examples that you have of sort of myths related to the Mediterranean Phoenician world that we might have a misunderstanding of because of Roman or other civilizations propaganda? So yeah, there, I mean, there's there's loads. I think the most interesting one, and it's something I meant to talk about in this conversation, but because it's a conversation, it just, we went in a different way. Um, but it's about the Tophet of Carthage. I don't know if you've come across this, but one of the most controversial aspects of sort of Punic Phoenician Levantine history is about child sacrifice um, because one of the only archaeological sites, because the Romans destroyed everything, one of the only archaeological sites in in Carthage today that still that dates from the Punic period is this sort of child graveyard. Um, so it's made, it's got all these votive stelae, which so look, basically they look like little tombstones, but they're sort of dedicatory carved pieces of stone. Uh, with dedications to Tanit and Baal, like the Phoenician, the Punic deities, and accompanying them are all these clay urns filled with sort of the burned, calcified remains of very, very young children, like newborn infants, sort of thing, very young babies. And there's a dispute among historians as to whether it's a child graveyard or if it's a site of child sacrifice. And for a long time, the idea that it was child sacrifice was considered to be a, a product of Roman propaganda. So that was the big that was the big story because a lot of the Greek and Roman sources that describe this are really vicious in their descriptions of child sacrifice. So, like the most important, the most I think it's Diodorus Siculus, a Sicilian historian, writing in the aftermath of Punic Wars. He writes this very graphic description of the ritual of child sacrifice in Carthage, where um, it's a situation in extremist Carthage is being invaded, and so to win good luck for the city, you know, to win the favor of the gods. They do this major ritual, I think, with sacrifice a hundred babies in one day, and they basically burn them alive. You know, they, there's it's very graphic description of a statue with its arms held up, and they put the infant in the arms of the statue, and it rolls down into a fire pit, and it burns. And there's all these myths that the the clay funerary masks that they had were put over, you know, used to sort of cover the cries, this sort of thing. So this the and there was also, and this source also claims that the reason they sacrificed 101 day is that a crucial part of Punic religion was that they'd sacrifice babies often and they would always be noble born babies, but that in recent years they'd got very, they'd got lazy with it and they'd actually been buying infant, the, the nobles who are meant to sacrifice their own children have in fact been buying children 
from poor women to sacrifice those children said so substituting poor children for noble ones and this is why the gods were angry so this this i certainly believe is a major act of roman of anti-carthaginian slander which we see down the ages and so the study of whether or not child sacrifice is practiced in carthage has been tainted by that but i still think that child sacrifice was practiced but nowhere but not in the same way that it's described in these sources this sort of very I don't think that they. I don't think there's any evidence apart from these these sources by people who hated the Carthaginians to suggest that they burned the children alive and put them a hundred at once into a fire pit. I don't believe that at all. So that I think is definitely tainted by propaganda, and it's still an ongoing ba- debate today. Um, but it's very difficult because history does become politicized for lots of reasons. When I was writing this book, I wanted to draw parallels between Carthaginian child sacrifice in Carthage and was sacrificed in this region as well so the levantine coast because very interestingly there are there are tophets in western punic world in carthage but we don't have any evidence of tophets here in lebanon or further south um and but i wanted to write about textual evidence for child sacrifice in this region and so i was you know i used the example of the old testament um because there's 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 references the kings of israel sacrificing children a very famous example is abraham going to sacrifice isaac Um, but crucially in the Old Testament, the practice is discouraged. But I was almost, my publishers almost asked me not to put in the Old Testament references because they said said I'd get accused of anti-Semitism for even mentioning it. And I just thought, so always, even in modern days as a historian, you have like political undercurrents very much to have a bearing on what you can and can't write, what stance you take on things. It's very, it's very, it's, it's always thorny to, yeah. Sorry, long answer to a short question. Mm, True. Uh, Mr. Tom Young in the back. Can we pass the mic to him, please? Hi, hey, thank you, Katie. Uh, hi, thank you. Hey, hi, uh, thank you, Ronnie. Um, fascinating as ever. Um, I was, uh, I was really interested in, in the, what you were saying about the discovery of the, is it the, the burial tomb or the shrine of Melkart in the recent discovery and that it, that it has, you know, strong references to the three-day resurrection story, you know, the sun rising after three days of, of darkness. <clears throat> and obviously that, that, that's got a very strong connection to the Christian story. Mm. And I was wondering whether you'd met with any kind of um, uh, animosity or, or controversy with religious communities, obviously the Christian community, because, because a story like that does question the uniqueness of of the three-day resurrection mm. um well not yet maybe after this podcast episode i will but um yeah. but in general in this book you know i try to deal quite even-handedly with the space i give to different religions and so okay yes that's a, maybe you know that might not be the favorite passage for some christian communities but i don't dwell on it and i don't use that to undermine the christian tradition people can draw those parallels themselves they're clear to be drawn you know i don't push that um and other sections of the book you know you i talk a lot about early christian history so hopefully communities will be placated by by that approach yeah. but yeah we'll see what can i say uh, we'll see <laughs> good. diplomatic as ever <laughs> thanks Tom. cool thank you <laughs> Are there other questions? Anyone in the back? Yes, the gentleman way in the back. Yeah. Thank you for calling me a gentleman. Oh, that's Nadim Shadi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Nadim Shadi, please. Um, it's fascinating that you're, you, you were writing this book when history was unfolding at the same time with the almost in the same cataclysmic pictures that you imagine ancient history to be, I mean, the destruction of um, Antioch and all that. I often think, when, when I'm in Beirut, I often think that this, this is how the fall of Constantinople must have felt. And uh, but, but I have a question which is more contemporary. Uh, you mentioned the city-states. Do you think the Mediterranean is still city-states? Oh, that's an interesting question. In what sense? And could you elaborate more on what you mean? Uh, um, in the sense that the, the, I mean, I feel they, they still are. And, and even, um, I mean, if you want to mention religion, they, they have in the, in the, um, 
in the days when the Roman Empire co uh, combined some of the pagan rituals, um, the cities still have their patron saints mm. from those days, which are linked to um, the pagan the pagan world at, at the same yeah. time. And and if you look at the actual states now. Um, that are largely failing, the cities have much more uh, um, of an identity than than the states, in in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a really interesting question. I think I think I think I don't think that the Mediterranean is still made up of city states in the same way that the ancient Mediterranean was, because now you know now we do have countries, you know, we have nations, and I think people, generally speaking, that I've come across, identify more strongly with their nation, with their country, than with the particular city they're from. I think that's also down to the fact that the nature of a city is changing. So, you know, in antiquity, cities did have sort of one ruling class. Gen I mean, generally speaking, different across different cultures. But you had sort of the ruling class of citizens who were generally one religion and one people. And then you might have underclasses that followed, worshipped different gods or were enslaved and so on. Nowadays, our cities are so diverse that I think, you know, the identity of cities is often their diversity more than more than something something coherent that unites them. So I think in that sense, cities are very different. But you're completely right. In countries that are struggling, the cities might have might have more wealth, might have a stronger sense of identity if they're doing better because of more economic opportunity, more international input. But I don't. I don't think city states exist in the same way that they did in antiquity, um, because I think primarily people. I think what a city is has fundamentally changed, and people. I mean, our psychology of how we think of sort of allegiance and identity has shifted. And I think people relate more to their countries now than their cities. And also, you know, nowadays cities are so sprawling. One side of a city has a completely different identity to another, and people from one one area might have very little in common with someone from another area. So I think it has shifted. Is the mic still with Nadine? Uh, Nadine, could I ask you, how, how, how would you identify your feelings towards city-states right now? Like, are you talking about, let's say, Beirut as a city-state? Um, no, I mean... Is this working? Hello? Yeah, yeah, it's working, yes. I mean, even in the north, in the north, I mean, I have friends from Genoa, who feel very genuine and mm. and um, Venetians still feel very very Venetian. And there is there is still there is still that that I'm, if you meet any Alexandrian, they their the Alexandria identity in in a way is stronger than the Egyptian one for for Alexandrians. Uh, and so that that's that was my my um, reference. But you're Absolutely right about the changes and the states. Yeah. No, but, and you're right as well. Though in Italy, I think it's when you, in Italy is certainly where I've experienced some strong, as you say, strongest identity with cities and disdain mm. of other cities, rivalries between cities. So that that's certainly certainly true. And to a certain extent in Spain too, Barcelona and others. And yeah, and, indeed. Yeah. Mm. Any others? Silence, no one. I'll ask you then to touch on something that's maybe slightly more sensitive. We won't get too political in it. Just that the way you discuss locals in Tunis versus locals in Tyre mm -hmm. and how they relate to their Phoenician past. I found it interesting. I didn't know this. In Tunis, it's almost a divorced relationship. Yeah. They don't hearken back to any of that. Here it's much more complicated for other reasons. And just going back to my earlier example of being in Malta, it's like 100% everywhere. So your own experiences with that, when you were writing this book, sort of the, the human relationship to their own history. Yeah, I mean, so I, mean, I spent a lot more time, I spent a lot more time in Tyre than I did in Tunis and the areas around Carthage. But it is different, you know, in, in Tunisia, people they certainly know the stories of Dido and they certainly know about Hannibal. They're very mm. proud of Hannibal. I mean, Hannibal is, I mean, he's a historical figure to be proud of in many ways. Mm. You know, he's, he's hailed as one of the greatest military strategists. His military tactics are still studied today. 
Um, so that, you know, they're proud of that, but they certainly don't identify as Phoenicians. There has been a break. And I really think that is, you know, the fact that Carthage was really destroyed right. multiple times and that, yeah, I mean, and, and I think, you know, Phoenicianism, new Phoenicians in Lebanon, it had this awakening in the, you know, the 19th century, this renewed interest, and then it gathered some political momentum. And it just brought interest in this period and region to the fore for you know, a number of political reasons. And often the past is appropriated for modern politics. Um, but it did just bring about this renewed interest in, in the Phoenician history of Lebanon, which hasn't happened in Tunisia. Um, Tunisia, you know, they relate much more to the Berber and Arab, Arab heritage. Um, and there isn't this sort of nostalgia for Phoenicianism, yeah. no. Or even that enthusiasm, which you discussed, the National Geographic... Mm -hmm test in tunis it's sort of lukewarm um it just i mean but the, you know crucially in tunis i didn't meet anyone who'd taken part in the national geographic study yeah i mean i wouldn't have known i how to find them a lot mm -hmm. of those donations are non you know the sampling is anonymous right um they weren't the subject of the feature so you know maybe and because you know tunis is a a sprawling capital city you know walking around tyre if, especially in the Christian course, you're going to bump into someone who at least knows about, or if not took part in the study, it was a big deal. It's a much smaller community. Whereas mm. in T Tunis, it's like it would be looking for a needle in a haystack. It would never happen to just run into someone who'd taken part in that study. Right. Um, but yeah, it's not the same relationship at all. Any more questions? We have time for one more. Oh, yes, please, in the back. Thank you. Um, I think obviously one of the very central elements in your book is the Mediterranean. And when you speak about these places and these cities, it seems to me as if the Mediterranean is this body of water that's in the middle with all these cities around them that makes it possible to connect, that makes it possible to go from one place to the other and have this network of places and people. Nowadays, unfortunately, and I think this is due a lot to European policy, the Mediterranean is more seen as something that divides people in places, right? And uh, it's being instrumentalized, it's being policed in order to uphold these boundaries and these borders. Do you think um, there can be some kind of meaning or some kind of reference from these times to create this common sense of being Mediterranean people again, to enforce an identity that looks more on the common than on the differences? If I'd wanted, if I'd written the question, I wanted someone to ask me. I couldn't have. That's the. That's such a great question, and I 100% think that. I think one of the main points that I wanted to bring across in this book is that the Mediterranean is a conduit of shared culture and a heritage, and it shouldn't be viewed as a barrier. And in the introduction to the book, I talk about this immersive art installation piece I went to in Ravenna, um, just by chance, and it was called. Mare Magnum Nostrum, so our great sea. This this spin on the Roman term for the sea, Magnum Nostrum, the great sea. Um, and the the project was about, you know, it created like sort of 3D Mediterranean sea, sort of with the map image, but there were no country borders sketched around the edges of the sea. And they invited people from every Mediterranean country to send in their photos and they fixed them around. And it was to highlight the commonality and the shared experience. And that is something I wanted to highlight with this book. Um, because, you know, the Mediterranean as a barrier is, is presented as a barrier in the media all the time. Um, and we do have these deaths from, from, the, from migrant boats. And, you know, if you look at the difference in press coverage given to the submarine, you know, that went down off the coast of the state, off the coast of Canada looking for the Titanic, that's four lives that were lost. It's tragic. But the amount of airtime given to that um, and sort of the positive publicity about these great adventurers embarking on this adventure versus the very negative publicity, the very negative press given to migrants who drown in the Mediterranean. The gulf is huge. Um, you know, and I think, yeah, so I think the sea is politicized and presented as a barrier more often than not. And the differences between east, west, and north and north and south are what's constantly being presented. And yeah, sort of a, a big part of what, to, what I wanted to do with this book was highlight that the heritage and the history around the sea is shared. Um, and and yeah, it should be and the, the sea should be used as a point of connection rather than a point of division. So thank you for that question because it brings an important point forward. So yeah. Oh, one more question. Sure, one more. Uh, 
I can't wait to read your book. Thank you. My question to you is, did you write anything about Europa, who is a daughter of Tyr, and the myth that she gives, she comes from Tyr, and she gives Europe its namesake? I think she's, I, I, I hope that that reference stayed in. I think I wrote one sentence. She's a, she's a okay. flying reference because she's part of that, the history of Tyre that's, um, yeah, it's more widely known um, and it's a myth. But yeah, I think she gets a, a flying reference. And I think I write about my friend Tom's uh, Tyre art piece, which sort of was a collaborative painting by all the residents of Tyre coming together to paint the history of the city. And I think I mentioned Europa in that context, that she, on the back of a giant bull, gallops across across the scene. But yeah. If anyone is hesitating, I'm just going to read the last lines of the introduction. You're really, you're a talented writer. The names of these cities do not conjure the recognition that their glorious pasts deserve. The voices of those long ago made these cities great are heard only as whispers, if they are heard at all. This book is an attempt to bring to light the hidden pasts of these cities, to understand them, and to see what is left of the great but vanished empires and civilizations of the Mediterranean. It may be drive to Sur, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to returning. Uh, thank you for sharing your work with us tonight. I know the copies may be sold out. Look them up, Antoine. Call Antoine. Get more copies into Lebanon. Catherine Pangonis, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure. Thanks for listening and watching, and a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>